Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Eternal Son, you were born in the flesh of the Holy Virgin Mary, blessing our human nature. When you entered the temple, you filled the hearts of Joseph and Mary with joy, and you brought consolation to the righteous Simeon the elder, and to the widow Anna the prophetess. May we become your living and holy temples and rejoice in your presence among us. We glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to God, the Holy Trinity, to the Father, who is almighty, and to the Son, born of the Father before all ages, and who at the appointed time took flesh of the Virgin Mary, and to the Holy Spirit, who has spoken through the prophets and the apostles. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ our God, you were born of the Holy Virgin Mary and became man like us. Although you are the offering and offer yourself as the sacrifice, you went up to the temple to offer a sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, as was stated in the law. When Simeon the elder saw you, he took you in his arms and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he prayed to you, saying, Now dismiss your servant in peace. And Anna the prophetess professed your glory with those who had awaited your coming. Now, O Christ our God, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense to grant us on this holy feast a profound understanding of your plan of salvation. Nurture children and bless families, heal the sick, care for orphans and widows, sanctify monks and nuns, protect those who are near, and guide those who are far. Console the grieving and grant eternal rest and grace to the departed who have gone to their rest hoping in you. We glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, forever. Fulfill the old He would save us as foretold. 
O Christ, in your great love for all people, accept our prayers and the fragrance of this incense which we have offered through the intercession of Mary, your Virgin Mother, and Saint Joseph, your pure chosen one. Forgive the children of your holy church, heal the sick in soul and in body, and favor remember the faithful departed. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Kadishat Aloha Kadishat Chayelatono Kadishat Lama Yehuto Mishicho Deti Led Mehem Bat Dawid Itraha Dismiss me, I will rest in hope and peace. In my arms I have held you and have seen your saving light. Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, what then shall we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have achieved it, that is righteousness that comes from faith, but that Israel, who pursued the law of righteousness, did not attain to that law. Why not? Because they did it not by faith, but as if it could be done by works. They stumbled over the stone that causes stumbling, as it is written, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion that will make people stumble, and a rock that will make them fall, and whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God on their behalf is for salvation. I testify with regard to them that they have zeal for God, 
but it is not discerning. For in their unawareness of the righteousness that comes from God and their attempt to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for justification of everyone who has faith. Praise be to God always. Master, now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, When the days had been completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Messiah of the Lord. He came in spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and he blessed God, saying, Now, my Lord, you may let your servant go in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that shall be contradicted, and you yourself a sword shall pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This is the truth, peace be with you.
Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's feast is one of a question of presence. It's a festival of redemption. We will look at the question of what is holiness in this presence, and then a couple kind of practical details at the very end. So as we mentioned, today is a festival of presence. You'll notice on the front of the bulletin, I give the proper title that we use in the Syriac tradition, which is the ascent of our Lord to his temple. The Syriac tradition very much sees the baby as being the agent in all of this. He's the one who gave the law centuries before. He's the one who fulfills the law by coming to his temple at 40 days old, having his parents bring him. And so it's him taking possession of his temple. Remember that in the Exodus, the tent that was made had two sections in it. Eventually the ark was placed there, but it all represented, signified the presence of God among the people of Israel. But it was a symbol. And when the temple was built by Solomon, finally in stone and in cedar, during the dedication ceremony, God manifested his presence by the Shekinah, the presence, the cloud. And it became so dense that the priests who were inside the temple preparing it and consecrating it had to leave the building because they couldn't see anymore. But again, it was only a symbolism. And after the Babylonian captivity, during the, the deportations, the ark is no longer in the new temple that is built, which is there at the time of our Lord's presence. And so that, as we've mentioned to you famously, when the general Pompey of the Romans in 63 BC, when he had heard about these strange people that worship nothing, couldn't believe it in himself, just barged into the temple to go in beyond the curtain into the Holy of Holies, and he witnesses that he found an empty room. It was nothing. Our Lord's coming is to show that divine personal presence who is now present in his temple. And later on in the Gospel of St. John, in this kokash between our Lord and the Jews who are not receiving the Messiah, and they keep talking about the law of Moses, and they keep talking about the temple, and our Lord is trying to make them understand that the Messiah is the fulfillment of all of these symbols, all of these foreshadowings. And so eventually in one of these confrontations, he says to the Jews, he says, I leave to you your house desolate, empty. This is what you want? You want this building? Then I leave it to you. But it's empty. The Messiah has come. And that's why a generation later in the year 70, it's destroyed. And it has never been rebuilt for 2,000 years. Though, as kind of a forewarning, when it is rebuilt, it will be an indication of the coming of the Antichrist. So, forewarned is forearmed. Stay attentive. Now, this presence, of course, then, is entering into the temple. And, of course, we have this wonderful story of Simeon, of a man whose life is holiness, to the point where the Spirit of God has revealed to him personally, you will not die before you see the Messiah. And this is his great hope. We're told that he's been waiting the consolation of Israel. He's been waiting for this promised one to come. And surely in the darker moments, as he sat watching television, reading the paper, he thought, I'm too old now. And clearly the prophecies of Daniel are not fulfilled. I'm not going to see the Holy One. And the Spirit of God told him as he prayed the rosary, no, no, no you will be able to see the Christ. And that's why we're told this very unusual story. And it's very delightful today that we can celebrate this feast because normally, obviously, it lands during the week. It is the closing of Christmas. You did notice in the Kaddishat, it's the same embolism, the same verse that we use for Christmas. This is the 40th day of Christmas. And I had debated within my head to think whether or not we'd leave the decorations up and the Christmas tree and that. But of course, I freaked you out in so many details of Catholicism over the last three years that I don't want to keep pushing it always, the envelope. 
But it gives me the opportunity to remind you that Christmas is from the 25th of December to this presentation 40 days later. This is the Christmas season. The Christmas season doesn't begin at Halloween. It doesn't begin at Thanksgiving. Macy's begins at Thanksgiving with Santa Claus to say, come, buy things, spend lots of money in the store. But that's not, we're in the season of announcements. We're in preparation. And then our celebration should be going from December 25th until February 2nd. Like we have the 40 days after the resurrection, we have the 40 days of Christmas. Now, because Macy's has been telling us since the end of the 19th century that that's not the way it works, we think in that way. And so we are sick and tired of Christmas carols and Christmas decorations come December 28th. Now, you're them all down. And of course, it's nuts because we, we lose our understanding as Catholics of what the liturgical year is really teaching us. So today is the end of the Christmas season. So maybe there will be a Christmas tree here at the beginning of February next year. Forewarned is forearmed once again. But Simeon, because of this great spirit of holiness that's been given to him, is great hope. But you have to picture this, what takes event that takes place on this day. The young couple comes. Again, they're probably just in their late teens. They come with the baby amongst a, a, a whole multitude of other people in the temple, including other young families bringing babies for their dedication. The reason why the babies are dedicated is in the exodus of, from e Egypt. God reminds the people of Israel, all of the firstborn die, all of the human beings, all the men, all the animals die in Egypt on that night. And God reminds Israel, you too would have died if it had not been for the blood of the lamb on your doorposts. And he reminds them that the firstborn always belonged to me. And even amongst the people of Israel, the tribe of Levi itself, indicates the firstborn. And they have a special representation among the 12 tribes between God and the Levites. They're the ones who serve the temple. And of course, the sons of Aaron are in the tribe of Levi. But God reminds them, the firstborn belong to me, both of your animals. And your firstborn animals had to be sacrificed, brought to the temple, sacrificed and given back. But of course, human beings aren't offered in sacrifice. So you had to bring and offer an animal in the, in the child's place, redeeming him. This is the original meaning of redemption. The word in Latin just means buying back. But the child who's been given to you as a blessing as your firstborn is a gift and belongs strictly to God. And therefore, for you to keep this child, you must rebuy him. You must redeem him. You must purchase him back. And then you see in the gospel the two doves that are offered because that was the sacrifice for the poor. But when this young couple comes in this day, of course, in the midst of all this crowd to do all this, the commotion, we're told that there's this old man in the crowd. They don't know him. This is just an old man who's there. We don't know. Probably he'd been there all day. Who knows? We're just told that the Spirit of God moves him to go to the temple today. Today you will see the Messiah. So in the midst of all of this crowd, this old man sees this one young family. And that's the one. How does he recognize? Clearly only because of the grace of God and the Spirit upon him. And he starts going towards this young family. But remember, Joseph and Mary haven't been told what was going to happen today. They're just going for the ceremonies and the services at the temple. And all of a sudden, there's this old man shuffling through the crowd after them. And you can imagine between Joseph and Mary, it's like, um, do you know him? I have no idea who he is. All right, well, let's go over here. And this old man keeps coming after them until finally he meets up with them. You know, and, they're, and they're kind. They just don't know what's going on. And then you can imagine this old man says, may I hold the baby? So they, they don't, he seems unthreatening, so they give him the baby. And then all of a sudden he breaks into this magnificent canticle. Now I can die. Lord, you can dismiss your servant now because my eyes have seen the redemption, have seen your salvation. It's a very beautiful. Now in the Latin tradition for years, 
That canticle is sung every night as night prayer. It's known as the Nunc Dimittis in Latin. And it's sung every night as the last prayer, as part of the night prayers before you actually retire. It is quite beautiful because it's a reminder of this moment, the presentation in the temple, the mystery of the rosary. And it also reminds me to tell you that on this day, February 2nd, 37 years ago, I received my cassock. Now, I know when I first arrived, it was another one of those shockers. Why does Abuna always wear that black thing all the time? <laughs> Doesn't he own a sports shirt or a pair of jeans? Which to the answer actually is, no, I don't own any jeans, no. But 37 years ago, we lay, there were 14 of us in the class, and we lay in the sanctuary. And you have the cassock on one, you have a cassock in your surplus, the white short that we wear over the top of the black cassock. And you prostrate yourself on the ground, because it is your moment of the renunciation of the world. Which is why we wear black, it's your funeral pall. You go back to jeans and your sports shirt, it's not really the idea once you make this renunciation. And you're asked the question, what do you seek as they all lay here on the ground in the sanctuary? What do you look for? And the answer that came back was, misericordiam Dei et fraternitatem. We seek the mercy of God and brotherhood. And then you're taken out, the, the cassocks are blessed, and you go out, you're taken into the seminary, we went to one of the classrooms, and you change. And you'd been told, wear whatever your very best suit is that day. And for the men who had been in the military, they wore their uniforms and any medals that they had received. Make it as sparkling as you want before the first part of the Mass. And then, of course, after they've all changed into their black cassocks, they come processing back in, make all their mothers cry, because now they're wearing their funeral poles. And my beautiful son of 23, who had been in the military, who has all of his medals and now is renouncing all of this, left that uniform in that classroom, never to put it on again. It's a very moving ceremony, and it's why it's done on the Feast of the Presentation, the moment that our Lord comes in his presence to the temple. So we mentioned that the idea of holiness, when we talk about holiness, it has the three basic ideas behind it. Simeon's life manifests this. One is to set aside. That's the, that's the word consecrate, literally to make sacred, to set aside. Your Sunday is meant to be consecrated, not just the 60 minutes in the morning or an hour and a half or whatever it may be, but the day is consecrated to the Lord. Because what can be consecrated is existence, our being, existence, nature, time, and space. So when we have the blessing of the candles today on the presentation, of course, the reason why candles are blessed on the presentation is in reference to Simeon's canticle, that this is a light for the nations, this Messiah, and the glory of Israel. And so we, we bless the candles on this day because candles which have been set aside in that holiness and consecrated, the sanctity of the altar in that sense goes with these candles that are lit in your houses. And when you say the rosary or when someone is sick and you light the candle next to their bed, you're bringing that sacredness of the presence of the house of God itself into that bedroom into that living room during the rosary. That's the notion of the consecration of space, the consecration of time, and the consecration of being. But the second aspect of holiness is clearly in Simeon's life. He set aside his life with this great hope to see the Messiah. But in that setting aside, there's a, the second aspect of holiness is an inviolability. It's untouchable. My Sunday, which is sacred, is sacred. It doesn't get filled up because there's a good sale at Kohl's. It's inviolable. It's untouchable. And when we begin to think of that way, we begin to prioritize our lives better. The notion of inviolability to make holy. I think I told you maybe last week, or I've told some people, you know, a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago, we had some of the Colby students come here because they're studying immigration. But when we were either upstairs or downstairs, I can't remember, the teacher himself asked me, he said, 
But after your description of Heda Falls and the poverty that these people came when they when they the first generation of immigrants, how did they build this? And I told them that is a beautiful question, and it's very accurate. I said it's a question of priorities. What you held to be the most important. Any of those families could have selfishly said in the 1930s or whenever it was, no, I want my own washing machine. We're not going to pitch into just one and roll it up and down the streets. Anyone could have said that, but they didn't. Because whatever money I could have put into my own washing machine goes into the church. And that's how they built this gem. The question becomes is whether we, in our affluence now, will keep it up because it has to be maintained. That's the key. But holiness means we set aside inviolability. We see things that we want for the devotion and for the service of God. And in that inviolability and that separation of the whole thing, we move towards the notion of transcendence. That's the final notion of holiness. So that everything that in our lives isn't the fact that we're trying to just incorporate a religious service sometimes on occasion, which we tend to do naturally. Well, I can't go this Sunday. I, there's a good sale or whatever. We can't do this because something else is going to not allow me to go to the house of God. And that proves to us that that holiness of that transcendence has not overcome the earthly yet. On the contrary, we are subordinating the sacred always to the earthly. We go if it's convenient. We go if, we go if, we go if. And instead of saying, this is the day of the Lord, and everything else is subordinate to this transcendent vision, that is the ultimate characteristic of Simeon. We're told nothing else about the holiness of this man's life. We're just told that he's just and he's upright. But by understanding holiness, we're also told that everything in Simeon's life was subordinated to seeing the consolation of Israel. And so that is the profound aspect of the sense of holiness set aside, consecrated, inviolable, and transcendent. So that the paying of my bills, the finding of the new car, the putting the pool in the backyard, all of those things are fine in themselves. But they all have to be subordinated to a transcendent vision. And that's why those blessed immigrants who came and said, fine, we live in the poverty, we have this difficulty, we buy the one washing machine, but all the rest of the money is that the good Lord gives us go to building the house of God here, our pride and joy. That's the transcendent vision. And so holiness has that whole aspect of our being, space, and time being transformed toward the vision of God. And then, as I said, we'll leave you with two practical details. Lisa will cringe. Because when we mention the house of God, when we come into the house of God, and for those who are old enough, they remember when you came in, we used to genuflect. Because for the Latins, that's their sign of adoration. For us, it's that full, profound bow from the waist. That is the sign of adoration. Not a head bow, but the profound, and what we can do physically, depending upon our age, of course, and how well arthritis has set into those hips. But we do that profound bow before the divine presence, before the divine altar. That's the reason why when we come in. And that last little detail, this is the, this is the detail that we mentioned it. Maybe Lisa was like, never, don't do this is when we make the sign of the cross beginning in the beginning of our prayers, we are consecrating that space and that time because now I say the rosary, but because now it's time to hear the gospel and we listen to the voice of God. But an antiquity, and the boys have had this because we've done it in catechism, the others who have done catechism with me have this. From antiquity, both east and west, the sign of the cross is made with three fingers on top, two fingers are left below. It's a very small little gesture, but it represents, and even for the Latins, it was reminded in the 1215, this is the way you make the sign of the cross. It's not fly swatting with an open hand. Because it represents the Holy Trinity that comes to us in blessing. 
And the two natures of the one God incarnate, God and man, human and divine. And so that one little gesture, sometimes you'll see the Spanish who still do this, and then they'll kiss the cross. They kiss the three fingers in the end. There are all kinds of other little details that come in. But our little tiny gesture of that reminder of Trinitarian incarnational redemption is one of those little moments that time and space is transformed transcendently. And so that's the two little details on how to actually make the sign of the cross. Oh, and the only reason why the other Easterners go right to left is because they're following the priest's hand. And that's why everybody else in the East, other than the Maronites and the Armenians, they go right to left because they're following the priest's blessing. That's where that origin comes. If anyone asks you, why do you do it different than other Eastern churches? It's a little tiny detail, and, but that's where it comes from historically. And so may the Lord God give us on this Feast of the Presentation this true desire to seek both the mercy of God and fellowship within the body of Christ. So that that spirit of holiness that obviously transformed the old man Simeon becomes a characteristic of each of our lives so that we have a vision of inviolability and transcendence that sanctity and holiness can penetrate us all the days of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. so effectual that wherever they are lighted or placed, the 
prince of darkness may depart in trembling from all those places and flee in fear, alone with all of their legions, and nevermore dare to distort, disturb, or molest those who serve you, the Almighty God, to whom we raise glory and thanks now and forever. sheets in the pews for the transfer hymn for the feast of the presentation. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering and all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Simeon. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
876, the Anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. from all creation you are peace reconciling those who are enemies you are forgiveness to those who sin and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful open the door of your mercy to our petitions and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers make us children and heirs of your kingdom through your grace of your only son and his love for all people and through your holy spirit now and forever you are adored by all angels bless you humanity exalts you and all creation glorifies you look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only son and to your holy Spirit, now and forever God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility it is right and Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy, you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. 
He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly is the son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb, that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. <clears throat> he cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only son, Kyrie eleison. Wabiyamu haudukdum hashodilema bedchayim. In sabe lachmo bidao kori shanto, u barachu kodesh. Waksoya bedtalmi dao kodomara, sabe chula mehne kudhu. Ono denita fahro dil dahluf paikun wahluf sagiye metakseyo metiham husoyon haume wa haydan alam alamin. Kanna al kosa dam sikh wa men hamra wa men mayo Barakh wa qadash Wa ya bil talmi dao karo mara Saab ishta wa mehne kul khu Khonu deni tao Dmohu dilan diya ti ki khadato Dachluf aikun wachluf sagiye Mete shadu meti hand Khusuyun Chaume wal hoyin Dan alam alamin Do this in memory of me Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin? Who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured? Who can praise your plan of salvation for us? We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, Look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O Holy Father. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O love, have mercy on us and hear us. Thou 
awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Adin morio, manin morio, manin morio, ni te modrojo chayo kadisho, una genna lainu al korbo no hono. This bread, the body of Christ our God, be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of sins, for the forgiveness of for the pardon of faults and forgiveness of sins and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priest, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life in a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor. May those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed, ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen the Archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints. And in your mercy, forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed. Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions hidden in sin, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, 
and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity, and he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with that prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins 
and for new life. For the Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Thank you, Lord. We raise glory to the Lord of all creation, living but the lover of all people. Have mercy.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand, full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the Holy Cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So I think we can give a congratulations to Jonathan for making his first solo, his debut performance. Nicely done. The second is to call attention to the bulletins this week. We overlap the weeks of the dead with these feast days, the presentation this week. Next Sunday is the Feast of St. Marin. So we'll replace the week of all saints, not for the weekday masses, but just on the Sunday. And then, of course, we have all souls the last, the third week before we enter into the great fast. And the reason why I call your attention to the bulletins, the bulletins I'm going to be writing up on the stages and aspects of what we do in leaving this world as Maronites. And so what you have this week is the bulletin on how we receive our Lord when someone receives communion at home. Next week we will be talking about extreme unction, the anointing, and what it actually means in the divine mystery. And then the customs, the Maronite customs surrounding the funerals will be the third week for All Souls Week. So it's just to call your attention to be attentive to the bulletins. Make sure you take them or check them online because they will be filled with things these three weeks dealing with death and our departure to the kingdom. So go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.